Thank you. It's a real treat as always to be here, and I'm really glad you're here as well because I don't think, frankly, we have a better value-added program country or just continuing to keep our, our skills alive. It's, it's probably some of the best PM we can give ourselves being at these programs. And I think and even aside from the educational content, just the networking and hanging out with your fellow buds, getting out to the vendor show, there's just some kind of a renewal, a recharging of your emotional values in a sense, because you guys are in, many of them work in hospitals, it's a brutal, brutal environment. I was in there for 20 some years, getting your ass kicked almost every day, when you're doing your absolute best, and you expect someone to thank you, and you get nailed for it, but uh, being here, you're kind of a really renewing, recharging event. So we're gonna dive into some cardiology issues and covering quite a bit of material, actually. And some of this stuff you probably already have a handle on, depending on where you may have been, your educational background, just from hanging around the hospital environment by osmosis, you probably learned that. But hopefully there'll be some new material in here uh, as well. And um, by the time we get done here, uh, I'll have my email address in here. If you want to copy of these slides when we get done, just shoot me an email. I'll be glad to send you uh, every one of these slides when we get done here. We're going to rip through this stuff kind of quick. Covering a lot of material from basic anatomy all the way through electrophysiology and some of the dynamics associated with blood pressure and flow. And this is why there is no place else in the environments that we work where we intentionally, deliberately make electrical connections to our patients' bodies to measure ECG, electromyogram, EMG, EG off our brain. Nowhere else do we invade an artery with fluid filled catheters to measure blood pressure continuously. Nowhere else do we put hoses in the trachea and airway to deliver ratios of air and oxygen at precisely controlled volumes, rates, and pressures. Uh, this guy also is probably not going to the bathroom anytime soon, right? So he has a, probably has a Foley catheter in his urinary bladder. We can even put temperature uh, thermistors in those catheters to measure body core temperature. As long as we got stuff in there, why not get the most information out of it? So fundamentally, every orifice we've got, we stick stuff in there. We can do that. And if we run out of holes, we'll just cut one in there and put more stuff in. Because that's what we do. But that makes these patients, not figuratively, but literally, one with the machines that you guys work on all the time. And it's not just a semantics game. It is literally one with the machine. And that adds a whole host of complexity, as you all well and painfully know. We'll be just focusing on cardiology, but if you've ever had any formal physiology, you probably know that we tend to study this stuff, the books are written this way by individual organ systems. So you might have a whole chapter or two on cardiovascular, a whole organ, a whole chapter on renal kidneys, reproductive system, endocrine. All of these different individual systems with the body, what makes it so sick and complex is that many of them interact and complement and work with each other. You know, unlike our basic clock diagrams, the behavior and operation of a transformer is not dependent on the diode rectifiers and vice versa, but that's not the case with our physiology. So where we're going is the overall system of uh, the, the cardiovascular system and uh, some from an anatomy and from a functional perspective as well. And the functions, most of the you know, lay people tend to think, well, yeah, it carries oxygen, carbon dioxide around the body. But it actually does a whole lot more than that. It's a very sophisticated transport mechanism so that it actually transports nutrients, glucose, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, uh, as long as, as, along with the waste. So it's a real funky concept. It's like having your grocery cart loaded with food, but then you got all your body fluids and poop and pee and stuff in the same basket that's carrying it all around throughout the body. Hormones, uh, we've got five different kinds of white cells that are constantly working to keep us uh, safe. Infections, antibodies, uh, even heat. One of the reasons you get, you get frostbite is the body and its wisdom. You start to get too cold, it'll just shut off blood flow to your ears, nose, fingertips. I don't need that. I got to keep the heat for myself. So, transporting all of these things is what the system kind of does. When we talk about the, the system, we're basically referring to the heart, arteries, the great vessels, as we call them. And there's two fundamental major divisions we have called pulmonary and the systemic circuit. In the textbooks, you'll often see these diagrams with red and blue indicating the arterial systems on the red. So our oxygenated arterial blood leaves the heart and is transported throughout the body. The tissues quite literally are sucking oxygen out of that blood and dumping carbon dioxide and waste products back to the blood. And then that venous blood, which is often indicated in blue, is sent back to the heart to be Recycled again. So the right side of the heart 
is part of the pulmonary circuit, sending blood off to the lungs, and the, right, the left side is sending it off to the rest of the body. If you've ever seen, um, I didn't answer the blood is in blue, but deoxygenated blood does have a slightly different visible color difference to it. Uh, and even oxygenated blood, especially under carbon monoxide poisoning, carbon monoxide has an affinity for the hemoglobin in the blood by two to three hundred times more than oxygen. So it makes the blood look really bright, bright red if people are exposed to carbon monoxide. But you know, the fundamental, uh, again, great vessels as we call them, on uh, uh, this, this big blue vein is superior to be the cavity, is basically draining venous blood from the head and neck into the, the right atria. And then we have a comparable big two inferior vena cava bringing all the blood from the lower extremities. And then, of course, the aorta branching off of the left ventricle, carotids going off to the brain. What's also wild in this uh, aortic arch and these carotid arteries here, there's actually specialized pressure sensors, baroreceptors, they're called. They're actually miniature biological pressure transducers that are continually monitoring the pressure uh, at the level of the heart. You don't want to blow your brain out if the pressure gets too high. Those sensors tell the brain to tell the heart to chill out and come so we don't uh, blow your brain out. Do you guys work on balloon pumps? Intraaortic balloon pumps? Some? Yeah. Anyway, the balloon, we'll get into this in a little bit, that intraaortic balloon is placed in this portion of the descending aorta. We'll see a little bit about that coming up. But we have a number of uh, schematics that we can use, and typically, our, you know, our geeky techie people like us, we like diagrams kind of like this that helps us visualize things. But this is the path that the blood basically takes through the body in a kind of a clockwise manner, leaving the left heart, leaving the left ventricle through the valve, through the aorta and all the branching arteries to the tissues and the organs. Again, where the tissues are sucking the nutrients and the oxygen out, dumping their waste products back in, sending that venous blood back to the right atria, through some more valves, through more valves, through the lungs, and the whole process just continues for as long as we're hanging around. Okay. What's also wild is at the level of the lungs, you may have heard of some of these things, we have millions of these small little air sacs in our lungs called alveoli. You can kind of picture it like a grid without the, um, the skin. I don't know what happened with the lights. That just happened, didn't it? I don't know if we can keep figure out how to turn that down, that'd be cool. Anyway, but well, we're still if you can still kind of see it. But anyway, uh, it, the, the grapes without the inside, the, the membranes are so incredibly thin, very, very, very thin. And there's so many of these little air sacs, we've got like 70 to 80 square meters of surface area. So the, the blood coming through these pulmonary capillaries is in contact with this air-filled sac, and that's where are the gases exchange. Just because of pressure differentials, partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the air sac than it is in the blood. So oxygen pours into the blood, and conversely, carbon dioxide partial pressure is higher in the blood than it is in the air sac. So it's these pressure gradients that causes those gas exchanges. We've got four chambers in the heart. Two superior on the top called the atria, left and the right. And again, the right side is associated with the pulmonary circuit. Then we've got a bunch of seats up here, if you like. So. And then two uh, ventricles, left and the right. You'll often see in these pictures that the left side of the heart is, has more muscle to it. The uh, right of the muscle of the heart is thicker on the left side because it has to generate more pressure than it does on the right. So the muscle, muscular side on the right side is a little bit thinner because it doesn't have to generate as much pressure. Okay. There's also four valves in the heart, and these valves just behave like check valves. And you're so comfortable. One-way fluid flow valves are like a dial, so like the number dial, they only allow flow in one direction when they work properly. You've got a whole bunch of pathological conditions, mitral re regurgitation of the valve gets a little funky. It doesn't uh, prevent flow in one direction. Thanks for checking, though. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. 
But on the uh, on the right side, again, there's a valve between the atria and the ventricle. These are called AAV valves. So on the right side, it's also called the tricuspid. The three little cusps on it. And on the left side, we have a uh, mitral or bicuspid valve. And then leaving the ventricles on the left is the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. On the right side. Then we have artificial valves. That's a Medtronic ball valve. Um, and some of you probably know we also use uh, porcine or pig valves. We also use tissue from cows or bull bean valves to, to create artificial um, valve replacements. The benefit of the, the um, porcine or the bull bean valves is that you don't typically need any type of regulants. Uh, but they only last maybe 10 years or so, 15 years before you got to do something again. With but a cross section of these valves. Uh, you can kind of see here, if we took a slice through the valves, you can kind of see how the relative shape of the valves are. And the key thing to remember for right now, we'll, we'll come back to it in a bit, is at the aortic valve, right on the outflow side of the aortic valve, are two little inlets to the coronary arteries. So you guys work in a cath lab, maybe, too? One of the things that cardiologists do, which is really, even if they could be some of the biggest jerks out there, they're incredibly skilled people because they're taking this little thin catheter, a piece of spaghetti almost, and they have to ultimately wind it up using the fluoro, pass it into these coronary arteries. And we'll see the significance of that anatomical placement of those vessels here in a bit. There you go, oh, super. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. It really helps quite a bit. Doesn't it? Yeah. Great. Anyway, another thing to think about the heart at rest, the heart puts out about four to six liters of blood per minute. Cardiac output is slow. Liters per minute, slow by gallons per minute, liters per minute, about a gallon, gallon and a half at rest. And what the body is, while the infinite wisdom does, it will stock up. Take P parts of that flow depending on what the individual needs of the organs are. So depending at rest, uh, if you're doing a lot of heavy cognitive mental work, the brain might get more blood, you know, than another body part. As we start to move around, these blood flows all start to change, all automatically in response to what the body is needing. It's almost like the heart is you think of as a current source, a constant current source, and all these organ systems and tissue beds are variable consistent. So it's going to, they're going to automatically adjust and, and get, get the blood flow that they, they need. Another kind of neat schematic, again, the heart leaving, blood leaving the left side of the heart. And what happens at the smallest level of the artery, arterial system, these are called arterioles. These little vessels are wrapped in little pieces of smooth muscle. It looks like little baby hose clamps or a needle valve at the level in the blood flow now controlling the individual capillary beds associated with a given, given organ. And depending on the metabolic needs, the body, again in the wild wisdom, will just maybe shut down blood flow if a tissue doesn't need that much blood. Whereas it will open up the needle valve on those tissues, muscles, and things that you start running up and down the stairs where we need more blood. All of that's controlled through the autonomic nervous system brain, controlling, adjusting, those little valves, all of those materials. Many of our drugs for blood pressure and stuff, they work at that level of the, the arterial. Okay. What, what ultimately happens, this speed of the velocity of blood coming out of the left ventricle is highest right at the aorta. And sometimes it can be so high, it actually starts to delaminate or guys <laughs> walls of the aorta. But the key thing is, is, by the time the blood gets down to the level of the capillaries, the velocity is very, very slow. So you can think of the kind of the blood flow like a, a straight car, you know, hauling ass down the countryside 100 miles an hour, gets into town, it's going to slow way, way, way down. And it does that purposely because here is where all of the gases are exchanged, the nutrients are exchanged. So the train slows down so everybody can get there take their stuff off the train and put their garbage back, back in. And uh, quite literally, we have thousands of miles of capillaries. I can't even get my head around that. It's, it's in the tens of thousands of miles 
of capillaries. These little vessels are so small, this is the actual full micro gap. Red blood cells are literally lining up single file to get to the capillaries. That's how small they are. And it's at this level, these walls are very, very thin. So oxygen crosses the wall to the capillary, carbon dioxide from the tissues go into the capillary, nutrients leave the capillaries. If you had a sliver or you got injured, the capillaries can actually open up. And white cells will leave the opening in the capillary to go and tap the form invaders. So that's why you get swelling and edema, you know, around a, a puncture being torn. Wow. And this is one of the reasons why red blood cells only live for a few months. They have to be they're called formed elements because they get regenerated every few months because this is a torturous life. These little cells, they squeeze them through these little capillaries, they get banged up, and they bust up, and they break up that once so they have to be continually regenerated. Okay. Once the blood is gotten through the tissues, especially in the lower extremities, how does it get back to the heart? So we don't have any pumps in our feet, you know, pumping the blood back up there. But we do have a whole host of specialized little valves in our major veins that are going right up through our muscles. So just through passive moving around of your legs, the contracting muscles are massaging and moving the blood back up to the right heart. And as long as these little valves are designed to prevent back flow when they work. And when they don't work, but they become incompetent or they prolapse, that's what gives rise to varicose veins. And they can appear in the superficial veins, they'll start to get bluish around the legs or the groin, and that's because those little valves have, they kind of became weak, and so blood is backing up and cooling. The same thing happens in the retina uh, with uh, hemorrhoids, internal or external hemorrhoids. And this is what happens if you, know, you don't get enough fluids, if you're sitting on the throne all day long reading the newspaper. Boy, like a, you create all kinds of nature of abdominal pressure that kind of blows up the little mouths. And that, that's kind of the result. We're healthcare professionals, we can talk about that. <laughs> okay. Another wild thing, anatomically, and I don't know if you ever quite thought about this, but the heart sits in the chest and it's protected mechanically, fortunately, by the sternum, parts of the rib cage, but it's on an angle in here. And there's a significance of that angle, electrically, we'll see, because there's this axis here, this vector, is what we call a cardiac axis. And this is what we'll see happens, is the electrical activity in the heart moves from the, the base of the heart, it's called the top, this is the apex on the bottom, moves in that general direction. This is also why we put the defibrillator paddles where we put the paddles. We put the, you know, one paddle uh, up on the right shaft, Apex is on, on the left side because we want to get as much of that defibrillator energy through and along that, that axis. It also explains why when we get to our electrocardiogram, our V leads, V1 through 6, are along the left side of the chest because of this is the transverse view now. Those lead wires in V5 and 6 allow us to see the posterior backside of the heart. Another cool thing about the heart, there's just infinite wisdom in all of this stuff. The heart itself uh, it is wrapped it is in a wrapped in a memory, a serous membrane called the pericardium. So it's almost like the heart is in a fluid-filled little baggie. I don't know if you guys ever got to see some open heart surgery. If you get to see that, you get the heart's it's just torqued away in the chest. It's really Find it away in there, and by, by being in that pericardium, there's just a small amount of fluid, clear, serious fluid in there. It dramatically reduces the friction of that, that's being hard. Sometimes it can get filled with pus or blood uh, that can create restrictions for the, for the heart. You'd also see, uh, again, they don't look blue and red, but in general kind of shape of the vessels, there's also a fair amount of natural fat also. That's there for some thermal insulation, but also some shock absorbing uh, characteristics. Okay. Remember those little openings to the coronary arteries at the outflow side of the aortic valve? There's a left main coronary and a right coronary, and they just literally branch around the heart. And those are the vessels, the arteries that feed the heart muscle itself. And again, they start off left and right, but then they branch to get smaller and smaller. And when one of those arteries or a branch of the arteries comes obstructed, that's what creates a heart attack. 
a myocardial infarct is an interruption of the blood flow to a particular portion of the heart. And if that has gone on long enough, you can actually visually see the, the damaged heart muscle. It turns almost a different, slightly different color. And what that fundamentally means when that dies, you don't necessarily die if it's not major enough, but that heart does not contribute to any contractile forces of the heart. It's still there, it's like a plug, just an inactive piece of scar tissue. And it also, in its wildly infinite wisdom, the heart and the body can sometimes know months, weeks, maybe even years in advance that they're going to have a heart attack. It's, it's sensing something is going wrong, so it starts to create these things called anastomosis, or little collateral circula circulations around the eventual clot. So if the big one does come along, then we've got a little bit of backup, a little protection uh, in, in place there. Um, your cath lab dies. In fact, Steve, have you ever been in one of Steve's sessions on injectors, contrast injectors? If you work on contrast injectors, Steve Mall, I think he's doing a session right now. But those are the machines that we use to pump contrast agent into the coronary arteries. It's almost a viscous, uh, syrupy, clear fluid that uh, it takes a big, fair amount of pressure to get that fluid into the coronary. But this is how we image the coronaries. And once we do that, we can, the, the cardiologist can find out what the clot is, and then we can often put a, a, a stent, which is basically just a fluid-filled balloon with a metal mesh around the, around the stent. And that in the 80s, before the metal stent became available, we just were using balloons. So we just you know, open up the coronary, and we get relief for a while, then they often close up again. So the stent minimizes that. Many of these stents also have drugs, that can coat the surface, drug eluding stents that minimize some of, the, some of the inflammation. But they found out years and years later that, yeah, it helps minimize the inflammation, but it also interrupts that very same anastomosis process of cardiogenesis and creating new blood vessels. So we, we, we get something, but never for nothing. We pay for it somewhere kind of along the way. Okay. The uh, movement of blood through these different chambers is all controlled by the valves. We have these four valves. And these valves open and close fundamentally all based on pressure changes. Just like our, our semiconductor diodes, you know, you need about 0.7 volts anode to cathode before the thing conducts. Same thing with the valves. We need a little pressure differential across the valve to open it or to close it. And so when the AV valves are open, Blood is kind of just passively coming right from again here the vein came up on the right, very veins on the left, and it's just kind of passively passing through the atria into the ventricles. So the ventricles are filling up with blood, pressure increases, and then snaps the valve closed, the AV valve is closed. And then once the heart muscle itself is stimulated, we'll see how that happens in a bit. That's what now when the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the aorta, <coughs> opens the valve. So we get ejection out of both the left and the right side simultaneously. <coughs> and this is the mother of all diagrams. It looks kind of complicated in methane, but what we have, this is just what happened with the left ventricle right now. This is pressure, left ventricular pressure, this is volume. So if we just start anywhere down here at the bottom, right here, say when the mitral valve opens, Basically, what this is telling us is that the heart has about 40 mL of blood in it, so the so ventricles don't empty completely. I don't know if we ever knew about that, but there's there's about 40 mL, about a shot glass worth of blood in the ventricles. Mitral valve opens. Now the ventricles are filling up with blood. Fill, 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 fill. Give you 120 mL, maybe three shot glasses or so. And right at that point, mitral valve closes. Now, this is the point where the heart starts to get stimulated. Squeezed. All the valves are shut at this point, so the pressure in the ventricle goes up to that. And when the pressure in the ventricle, right at this point, exceeds the pressure in the aorta, <laughs> aortic valve opens. Then we get ejection. So blood is flying out of the heart. Push, 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 until the pressure in the aorta exceeds that in the ventricle. So the aortic valve closes. 
And it's these two points here where we get our diastolic blood pressure and our systolic pressure. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. But then the whole process stops and it just starts all over. So if your heart rate, for example, was 60 beats per minute, that would be one beat per second. This whole loop would take one second, one cycle. Okay. People with diseased hearts, cardiomyopathy, they have enlarged hearts. So this whole curve shifts to the left. And but unlike other muscle, when it becomes big, the heart muscle, when it becomes big, becomes weaker. So it's not a strong muscle. It'll hold more blood, but it, it, it can't eject as much. So this concept here of the stroke volume is smaller. And people with cardiomyopathy. But this kind of also uh, ejection fraction, that's a real, real powerful metric of heart health. And the higher that is, generally the better fit you are cardiovascular wise. But normally, we're in the 55 70 percent range, which says maybe 55 70 percent of all of the blood in the heart is being ejected. That's all that sense. There's still people out there when they get really bad, they can be in the 20s. Very, very sick at that point. We have these two phases also of, of the heart cycle. One's called systole, and the other is diastole. And this is associated with systolic, diastolic pressure, you'll see. And what's also really funky here is this is systole here, is during this contraction phase. I'm called isovolumetric constant volume. So the heart, all the valves are closed, the heart's being squeezed. So the heart is working here, work, 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 and it's squeezing all through the ejection phase. And then the uh, valve closes and we rest and we start filling again. The cool thing is, is that the heart spends about two thirds of its time in diastole, and about a third working. So it's like working for eight hours a day and you sleep for 16. That's not a bad deal. You just kind of take it off for a long time. The other thing that happens uh, is because of the placement of those coronary arteries on the outflow of the aortic valve, it's during this two-thirds of the cycle that the heart is getting its blood. So when the, when the rest of the body is being perfused, getting blood, the heart's being starved, essentially, of blood. The heart's not getting any blood when the rest of the body is. It's during this resting diastolic phase that the heart's hitting this one. Cool design, and you get right down. Okay. Another very basic, simple concept the output, cardiac output, again, flow, meters per minute, is equal, simply equal to our heart rate times school flow. Any of you guys, runners, bikers, do a lot of aerobic work? But if you are, one of the reasons you'll typically have a very low resting heart rate is because your heart is so much stronger, your stroke volume is bigger. So you can be down at 40 beats per minute, but if you have 125 ml stroke volume, 125 times 40, you'd still be at you know, 5 liters per minute. Whereas if you had a smaller stroke volume, your heart rate has to be harder to get the same blood flow. So there's a real serious physiological benefit of having a uh, good stroke volume. We can measure cardiac output, and we used to do more of this, it seems, years ago, and I think it's kind of decreased a little bit because it's just an intrinsically very risky procedure. We actually have a special type of catheter, you may have heard of the swan line, a pulmonary artery wedge catheter. Basically, we can stick a special on the catheter, the subclavian vein, or jugular vein. We can, and this is done right at the bedside. You don't even need to be in the OR. You can run that catheter right down into the right side of the heart and also into the right ventricle. And we inject either a cold saline or room temperature saline, basically mixing a cold bolus of saline, just about 5 mLs or so, in with the warm blood. And we can monitor the temperature change in the combined blood saline mix. And actually, the diagram really should be goes the other way. There's a slight dip in the body in the temperature of blood. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you shoot a big ice cold bowl of water into a hot cup of coffee, you're going to decrease the cup of coffee. Okay. So by, by knowing 
the temperatures and then the length of the tetra catheter and everything, we can we can compute cardiac output from this change in temperature. So the faster the blood is moving, for example, the area of this little temperature curves will be less. But it's a risky procedure. You get a lot of great information, but you better really need the information because uh, you, know, you can perforate the heart, you create all kinds of problems. So you really need it. The other thing that it has to do, and this is what this concept of afterload is all about, it's quite literally the pressure in the arteries now that the heart has to push against to get blood. It's like analogous to trying to get out of the room here. If you got some big gorilla on the outside of the door holding the door shut, the gorilla is the afterload. And you're the heart trying to get through the door. And so this is what happens in a lot of disease. You got any kinds of most of different disease pathological conditions, afterload goes up, as afterload goes up, stroke volume goes down. One of the wild benefits of an aortic balloon pump, is aortic balloon pump, it reduces afterload. So it's right before, right before um, systole, right before the opening of the aortic valve, we deflate this balloon. We use typically use helium, very low mass of gas, so we can you can pump it in and suck it out very quickly. Right before the heart is to be checked, we deflate the balloon. And what that has the effect of doing hemodynamically is while you're trying to push out the door, somebody opens it at the same time. And you go, oh God, that was easy. So if you're a sick heart, and you can reduce the afterload, just well, sometimes just for a few hours, the heart will really thank you and recover quite what also happens is right after the ejection is when we optimally inflate the balloon. So right after the right after the valves, the aortic valve shuts, we'll inflate the balloon, and what that's going to do, it's going to increase pressure in this part of the aorta. And remember, the coronary artery inlets are at the outflow of the aortic valve. So this increase or augmented diastolic pressure in the aortic arch gives more blood to the heart. Remember. So increased coronary perfusion, reduction in the afterload is what it does for our patient. But the timing, as you can appreciate, is trickier than hell. If you only if that balloon's inflated while you're trying to eject, you're going to have all kinds of chaos going on. Okay. Anyway, electrically, this is the part of the conduction system. And all of the stuff we've been talking about so far are mechanical events. Pressure the valve changes, all of that uh, is preceded by this electrical activity. So the electrical activity of the heart is what creates mechanical stuff. And we have a couple of really wild concepts. One is biogenic. Genic means that the heart generates its own electrical activity. The brain doesn't tell the heart what well, it can control the heart, but it doesn't tell the heart to set its feet. If you ever had some high school biology, you can take a heart out of a turtle. If you nourish it, it will sit there all by itself. That's what we mean by myogenic. And it's also autorhythmic. It has its own kind of internal uh, pace. And we have a couple of other serious structures here we'll, we'll see. But it's almost like the uh, heartbeat, which originates in what we call the sinoatrial node. It's a specialized little patch of tissue in the upper right atrium. And it's almost like it's a little relaxation oscillator, electrical. It just generates action potential, electrical pulse, a measurable electrical pulse has a uh, you know peak value maybe 10, 20 millivolts, and in negative it goes to about minus 60 millivolts. This is an actual measurable voltage. It's not a theoretical hypothetical concept. It's a measurable electrical pulse, and that pulse we'll see is what spreads throughout. The heart. So it starts out in the sinoatrium node and it literally then spreads throughout the top two chambers of the heart to the atrium. And it's flying along at a pretty good speed. Uh, and it's almost like you know six lanes of cars on the freeway. If you can imagine it's spreading around the top of the football in, in time and space. It gets to the AV node here. This is all called the gateway to the ventricles. And then now your six lanes of traffic are forced on like one light. And what do you think happens? <laughs> you know, the traffic dramatically slows down. The heart does that purposely 
because the ventricles are filling up with blood at this point. And so we're going to slow down the very thing that's going to contract the ventricles and let that blood fill up. As soon as the ventricles filled up, now the freeway opens up six lanes again. The action potential hauls ass down these left and right bundles of these pinching fibers. This starts to stimulate our muscle. Another funky thing going on, if you want to try to get blood out of a bag, you know, yeah, you can just squeeze it. If you want to be efficient, what you're going to do, you're going to squeeze it, you're going to twist. And that's exactly what the heart's going on here. When these electrical impulses get down to this apex here, it travels out the heart in a spiral manner. So it's, it's stimulating the heart from the bottom, but it's, so it's, you know, it's a funky thing going on. It's a much more efficient way, electromechanically, to get the blood now out of the heart. You can kind of see another uh, concept of that action potential moving in time, temporal, as well as physical spatial. So if you can kind of picture visually in your head this pulse traveling throughout the heart in time and space. And depending on where we would look at it and measure it, it has a little different shape. But it, it's almost kind of like also throwing a pebble in the pot. You throw a pebble in the pond, you make these ripples until it hits the shore. Hits the shore is the inside of our chest, and these little individual action potentials add and subtract, add and subtract. By the time they hit the shore, we get our characteristic looking ECG. That's what the ECG, essentially where it comes from, is the combined net effect, that single action potential throughout the And it doesn't stop. Once it gets to the heart, because we're basically in a big bay of seductive sailing. Okay? So that electrical impulse continues to travel out of the heart. And if we put to put surface electrodes on our chest, we can pick up that electrical activity. And that's exactly what we do when we're getting an electrocardiogram. I had a design team got over 15 years ago uh, came to me and they asked me, you know, can we get an ECG off our butt? <laughs> it's a serious question because they were thinking about for a home health market of putting ECG electrodes in a toilet seat. And I thought, damn, that's kind of a cool idea. And I said, I don't know, but theoretically it should be all right. So I took one of the machines in my office. <laughs> this is not my butt. <laughs> I didn't try to do any skin for a meter, I just you know, slapped them on there. But I also slapped them on my chest, the lead too. And sure enough, you can see they're very distinct. She works. So this right off the butt cheeks, you're gonna be in there. <laughs> and there was a whole lot, and he actually got this thing. And the thought was the, the secondary benefit, if um, because they had to it was, it was gonna go to a caregiver or a doc's office or something. Well, if they didn't get an ECG after three or four days, or maybe the patient's dead, or they're all constipated or something, so there could have been some other reason for not getting any. Symptomy, but because elderly would be freaking out trying to put electrodes on an elderly person. You know, they think they're going to die, they're going to electrocute it, but they sit down at home, nothing they had to do. Just sit down, get the ECG. <clears throat> the uh, early electrodes, you may have some of these, seen some of these classic textbooks, uh, photos before the original electrocardiograph. We used to use just saline buckets, just water with saline, and we stick our limbs in it, and those were the electrodes. And those designations back in the day, left arm, right arm, left leg, we still use those today. But fortunately, we now use silver, silver chloride electrodes. These are the de facto standard electrode that we use um, to capture bioelectric signals. And they all have fundamentally the same kind of basic design. Of course, nurses call them patches, but they're, they're actually very sophisticated electrochemical cells. They're transducers, we'll see. In a bit, they actually have to have a silver, silver chloride coating on the little disc here, and then they have a, a conductive jelly surface. And then, of course, different types of tape, depending on where you're at. You know, neonatal kids, they have much more fragile skin, so you've got a gentler adhesive. Of course, if you're doing, you know, treadmill or bicycle or down or stress testing, they almost like a gorilla tape. You know, hold it on so they don't come off. But essentially what's going on there is that these electrodes are converting ion flow, which is what we have in the body, movement of sodium, potassium, chloride ions, into electron flow. 
I don't know if you ever thought about it, but we cannot send sodium down a wire. Right? You can't send chloride ions down a wire. So in order to measure those bioelectric signals, we've got to convert ion flow to electrons. And that's exactly what's going on in what the electrode actually looks like. Anytime we put a metal in contact with an electrolyte solution, we have a little battery. It's called a cell. There's actually a half cell, a measurable voltage available between that gel and the electrode. It's called the half cell potential. And one of the reasons we use silver, silver chloride, because of the very stable half cell potential. Uh, in, one, in fact, one of the reasons we have the lower 3 dB limit on our DC electrocardiographs, it's like 0, 05 hertz, is to block that half cell potential. Okay. So this is kind of what's going on. The uh, the ion flow is converted to electron flow at this point, and ultimately it's the electrons that then go to our physiological monitor. But there's a fair amount of equivalent electrical stuff going on between the skin and the monitor. So the gel, the gel is effectively designed to be a continuation of body fluid and tissue. Because the ions are going to flow through the body through that gel, and it's right at the gel um, silver silver chloride interface is where the transduction conversion takes place. And anything that causes movement, you've seen this before, patients move around, they can get uh, interference on there, and that's because we're disrupting that double layer, as it's called, between charges between the gel and the electron. It can also look like EMG artifact. Another feature of those electrodes is not a desirable one, but if you've ever, you ever been in an ICU or the old where they have a defib somebody, and you'll see the ECG just blows off the trace. That's because we basically put a super amount of charge on the electron, on the little capacitors in those electrodes, and we want that charge to, to dissipate very quickly because we want to know that a different later attempt actually work. If we used other metals like tin or something, you know, you'd be waiting for seconds, tens of seconds, maybe before you could see the ECG. So silver, silver chloride recovers very quickly, relatively after a shock like that. Classic 60 hertz interference. You may have seen this. Anytime you see a big white fuzzy baseline, we stretch that baseline out. You see a very typical 60 hertz signal on there. Uh, movement artifact from electromyogram muscles. Uh, is typically, you know, if you did a Schwarzenegger kind of thing, and all the isometric contractions, you get muscle in artifact the trees. Okay, but ultimately, that one single action potential, when it reaches the chest, has very, very characteristic components to it, and incredibly diagnostic, very, very, very rich with information about what's going on with the heart. And if you've ever, you, you, you hook yourself up, or you, next time you're in the OR, the ICU, the ED, you just look at a patient's waveform. One of the first things we'll see, we'll see P waves, it's QRS, and delay, and then a T wave. And every one of those components has a very significant uh, association with, with what's going on uh, with the heart. And it also has very significant intervals uh, as well. This is a single atom, this ECG. Again, if we see a P wave, this is often one of the things clinicians look, look for real quickly. Do I have a P wave? If you got a P wave, that tells you them that the atria have depolarized and contracted. So they're saying, well, oh, okay, patient's okay there. They've got the atria's working kind of okay. There's going to be a little delay here. Uh, and that's because at that AV node, you know, where the six lanes come down the one lane. And then now when that action potential Bundle branches to the Kinji fibers, we get this large spike, this QRX complex. This is associated with ventricular depolarization or contraction. So if they've got a PR, they got a P wave, atria are working. If you got a QRS, ventricles are working. Good, good stuff there. Okay. The other thing they're going to look for is you see this ST segment here, it's called. This is really significant if they're looking for a potential heart attack. This line here should be what we call isoelectric with this line over here. They should be electrically at the same level. 
If we start to see an elevation or a depression of that segment by only a couple millimeters, that can be a warning sign that you're in the throes of a heart attack. That's one of the first things you'll see. ST elevation, myocardial margin, elevation, depression. But that's what each of these little components are associated with. P wave, atria are working, QRS, vaginals are working. Again, the electrical things are causing the mechanical stuff to happen. The electrical impulses are stimulating cardiac muscle. And again, we typically record the, the standard paper speed, and even the sweep speed on the monitors is 25 millimeters per second. And so what that translates to the inverse of this, each little box of millimeters, clinicians call them little boxes. We call them millimeters, but they don't like millimeters, they just call little boxes, a big box. A little box corresponds to zero four seconds or three milliseconds. So they'll just, you know, very they're incredibly good at qualitatively looking at stuff and getting a, a diagnosis right away. So they look at this stuff, they say, okay, PR and goals should be uh, 120, 160 milliseconds. They'll just think I got four boxes, I'm good. QRS and I don't know if I got two, 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 three little boxes, I'm good. So just, they don't need to know if it was, you know, 19.568259 milliseconds. They don't think like me. They just qualitatively, yeah, you're good. And again, vertically, looking for suppression elevation of that segment. Good timing, thank you. You often don't need to do this anymore, but in the old days, you know, you may have seen the nurse at the nursing station, they had calipers, they had little coolers. Where we, before we had annotating strip charts that would put the heart rate and stuff already on the strip, you could determine the heart rate by measuring the interval between our arm and okay, because we're moving at 25 millimeters per second times 60 seconds per minute, if you divide that number, 1500, by the number of millimeters between our intervals, they'll give you heart rate. So if you want to press some nursing, I just look at the strip, especially if there's no annotation on it. It's called the number of millimeters divided into 1,500 now for the patients. We can do stuff like that. But anyway, this is this whole concept again of the cardiac axis. So you can kind of think of it as like we sometimes call it an electric dipole. You can kind of think of it as being a little, little cell, a battery here, where the base of the heart, the top part of the heart, is more negative electrically than the apex. So the action potential is essentially traveling from the right side down to the left side. And that angle is significant. That's called the cardiac axis. And for most normal people, it's around 60 degrees. Okay? Unless there's a whole variety of physiological conditions that can shift that axis. And if that happens, the interpretation of the ECG is altogether different. Okay? But we can get that all from our buddy Einfluen, who came up with this concept a long time ago. And um, we, we get a triangle from these three leads that he came up with. They're called the bipolar limb leads. And they just, they're just labeled with lead one, two, and three. So when we put our electrodes, for example, in our left arm, we're looking at that action potential that's traveling horizontally. When we put it on left arm to left leg, we're looking at the action potential that travels from right side down to the left side. Typically, if you ever know something before, you'll often get our largest QRS with the monitoring V2 because we're along that, that axis. So when you're just looking for heart rate, like from a Kelly, Kelly patient or something, that's a good lead to use. And lead three, the lower amplitude from left arm to left leg. Of course, right leg is common to all of these things. So these three different leads forms this uh, triangle. And the ECG, the same action potential is going to look slightly different depending on which you need measurement. So this is lead one, left to right, right arm, left arm, lead two, and there's an axis associated with each of these. And then left, left arm, left leg. Now, if you know, we have a color code. 
This is an American Heart Association standardized color code, and virtually all of our lead sets have that color code right on it. The leads themselves are colored that way. So if you ever, when you get called to diagnose any kind of ECG problem, very quick thing to do, white right. They have the electrodes on the right place. Because if they don't, you can get some inverted looking waveforms. Completely misinterpret the interpretation. So right should be white. Left arm is black, left leg is red, green should always be our right leg, and if there's a V lead in there, that will typically be. When I used to teach this stuff to nurses, we purposely have the mixed lead wires around to see how distorted inverted waveforms can sometimes become. So when we when we do what we call a diagnostic 12 lead, this is where the uh, electrocardiograph techs come along throughout the hospital with their carts and they, they hook all 10 electrodes on. We actually get 12 different views of the heart electrically. So we have Eindhoven's leads one through three. We call these bipolar because we're using two leads and a ground to get these signals. And the remaining six, we've got augmented leads called ABL, right? Uh, and left, and then six VVs, these are what we call unipolar, because we're just using one electron, now like a multi-V, we've got, we've got a black lead of ground, we're using one lead to measure these six other uh, leads. And they're all going to give us a slightly little electrical viewpoint of what's going on. The, 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 the AV leads, the augmented vector leads, and the V leads, we, what the, what's happening inside our electrocardiograph is essentially a virtual ground being created. It's, 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 in, and it's referred to as Wilson's or sometimes Goldberg's central terminal. It's, it's a virtual reference point effectively that's created artificially through the resistor network inside the machines. And it's from that electrical perspective that these other leads are being measured. We don't really get into it all, all too much. Just, I guess just qualitatively appreciate that. that Waveform, the, the single ECG looks very different depending on where you measure it from. And all of that potentially is, is significant for us because we're basically moving our electrical eyeballs around the heart from different angles. It's kind of like an electrical panoramic view we're taking of the beating heart. And why that's useful, depending on where you might have an infarct, damaged piece of coronary, you're going to have. Uh, alter the ECG. It's like you're driving into work every day and all of a sudden a uh, street, you're one of the major streets is busted. You have to take a detour. Anytime the action potential has to take a detour from damage heart muscle, it's going to screw up the waveform. It's going to look different. And the, the cardiologist will have to interpret. So again, our V leads is an electrical view all the way around the heart. So if you have some inferior infarct in part on the backside of the heart, we're going to see abnormalities of D6, D5. Okay, so this is kind of what, what we're doing here. This is where we typically put the beads. So you'll see them on the shoulders, depending on, oftentimes. They have crest at the waist, and then the, the knee leads from this buff dude. Things go right wrong. And if you ever see it, if you ever had one yourself, a good ECG text, you're going to palpate, you're going to feel for the intercostal spaces, you're going to feel between your ribs, one, two, three, four. And that's when they're going to put the electrodes in one of the space, and they, they palpate in position. So, off of our diagnostic 12 lead machines, again, the same heartbeat looked at from multiple views gives us a complete and different picture of what's going on. When we have detours, when we have something that's screwed up conduction pathways within the heart, we get what we call arrhythmias, abnormal conduction patterns. And we've got atrial arrhythmias, which are not as bad up in the life threatening ones, the trigular arrhythmias. AFib is a very, very common thing that's often successfully managed and treated with medication. Sometimes we have to shock a patient to get a lot of that. The, the primary ultimate concern of people with long standing AFib is the atria are going to flop around. Right that can damage the red blood cells. Red cells in the left heart go right to the brain, so you're potentially at a stroke risk if, you, if that goes on too long. 
clot, you damage the cells, close to the brain, you screwed up. Ventricular tachycardia, that normal heart rate. Why we get concerned about this is that this can be a precursor sometimes to ventricular fibrillation, it's much more uh, life threatening. Some of you may ever maybe do this sometimes. Sometimes you can actually feel it. We have ectopic beats or PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. So it's a, they don't even know. Sometimes I think they know, but oftentimes these things will just happen out of the blue. So I just kind of feel like a bunch of chart. You know, because the chart's going along, normal, normal, also, boom, it must blow off a weird one. And it'll give it you characteristic, very wide QRS, RJ amplitude. Sometimes people can feel these. Some of our monitors, you might even know, they might have little PVC counters up in the corner of the monitor, so we can, we can count these and monitor that because a couple every now and then is not typically a big deal. When we start to get a run of them, now we're getting a little spooky and we get a little more concerned. And of course, the worst of them all, ventricular fibrillation. This is when the heart is basically on electrical concern. If you ever got to see a fibrillating heart in the chest, it's a sister. It's a hot running station. We'll make sure just not doing anything. Blood flow, you have the blood flow, no blood pressure, and we gotta get you out of that quickly. And the only unfortunately barbaric we have a way of doing it is we shock you with a different way. And why it's barbaric, it's just like electrically we're going in there and we're gonna slap the shit up. You shark we purposely watch our to stop doing what they're doing purposely. And then we hope that hope that little SA move will kick back in. Well, maybe get back to the sounds good. That's the hope. But it's as crude as a barbaric thing. Well, Scotty from Star Trek, he'd have a field day with that probably. But again, what happens when it goes, if this goes on for too long, it goes from course we have to fly and ultimately to a system, which is not a good place. But, okay. Just a couple of things here, if we get a little few more minutes to run through blood pressure real quick. Uh, is that again the heart, the contracting heart is what creates the pressure. And the pressure is what causes the flow. And so blood pressure is nothing more than what we learned in high school, force divided by area. So compressional forces divided by the area of the vessel creates the pressure. And we measure those in millimeters of mercury. And what we have here now is time and pressure. We can see when the ventricles contract, the pressure in the ventricles almost looks like a halfway rectified sine wave. You can picture that from some of your electronics courses, the halfway rectified sine wave to beat. And then the pressure in the aorta uh, doesn't go down to zero because of its elasticity. So again, this is ventricular pressure in blue, our arterial pressure in red there, and that's what we're trying to measure. And that's what we do measure literally when we cannulate an artery or we estimate the take of the cuff. Heart sounds are correlated with that. Every time the AV valves close, it makes a sound. So this is the blood. And when the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonary valve close, we get the dub. So this is blub dum, blub dum, dum. And if we have problems with those valves, that's what a number is. So if the valve is a little haywire, it's gonna sound different. Here's what we're trying to measure again, systolic pressure diastolic pressure, and the mean pressure, it's not what often people will mistakenly think is the average. So we get a mean pressure, we, just, we don't take the average. Never, 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 never just do that. Because the mean, the true mean, because the heart spends more time in diastole, mean pressure is closer to diastolic pressure than systolic pressure. Typically just diastolic plus one third the difference. Heart starts out very pulsable, and then by the time the blood gets down to the level of the capillaries, it's steady state. The pressure down there may be only 20, 30 millimeters of mercury at that point. But again, this is where everything is exchanged on the at that point. And if you take it, there's a tremendous amount of ignorance uh, among even the most seasoned clinicians who are taking blood pressures. With this method, it's called sigma manometry. We're not actually measuring pressure at all. We call it blood pressure measurement, but it's not. We're estimating it from the presence or absence of flow. So what happens when that cup is placed on your upper arms, pumped up to the point you can't hurt? We're literally squeezing off blood flow, brachial artery, stepping on the guardrails. All blood flow is stopped. Stethoscope is placed distally a little bit downstream, and then the cup is gradually. Um, deflated, we don't hear any sounds, 
But when the blood starts to squirt through the vessel, as this gradually being opened up, it creates turbulence. And that turbulence creates sounds which are, are rock cough sounds. And you can hear them through the stethoscope. Very low frequency, very kind of low end. You have to have good hearing to hear them. But the, when we first hear the sound, that's where the clinician will say, okay, that's your systolic pressure. They continue to release pressure, release, release, release. The sounds get louder, louder, louder until they fade away. When they can't hear it anymore, that's what they label as diastolic. So it's not a measurement of blood pressure at all. It's an estimate, and a reasonably good estimate. You know, it's not to, not to get rid of it, but it's, it's, a, but it's still an estimate. Okay, and then when the sound, you first hear the sound, I'm getting ready to see the colic, and you don't hear the sound, I just, you can maybe appreciate the speed with which the cup is reduced can create errors. So this is kind of where we're getting it done. So if the key thing, it's an indirect measure or an estimate of true blood pressure. And this will be a thing that always messes up a lot of clinicians. They often wonder why the arterial pressure might not be measure. The transducer doesn't equal the pressure from the cup. It might, be, it might be just pure chance that it does, but they're, 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 different, they're different measures. When we measure with a cuff, there's a true pressure. With a cuff, it's, it's an estimate. Tons of different sources of air. The biggest one is the cuff size. And it's, it's still amazing how many clinicians don't really know that. If you have a great big Arnold Schwarzenegger do the standard adult size cuff, invariably the cuff is going to, the, the pressures that they're going to be are going to be much higher than they give the are. They're going to hold the estimate. And conversely, if you have an elderly frail elderly person or somebody with smaller arms, you're going to get pressures that are lower than they actually are. So cuff size, ideally it should be the width is about 40% of the circumference. That's the, the optimal. The silometric methods work on the same way, but it just, they just eliminate this variability with manually deflating the cuff, and it picks up those vibrations, those corrupt cough sounds, through a transducer of the cuff. When we're doing arterial measurements, uh, one of the key things we're looking for here is this dichrotic notch. This is when the aortic valve closes. So when that valve slams shut, it creates a little reflection, if you will, and so a good, a good arterial waveform should that not should be quite prominent. Same kind of times that the water hammer when your washing machine abruptly stops filling, you hit that boom. The reason you have those snubbers on there is to basically absorb this, this water hammer effect. That's exactly what's going on in the um, cardiovascular system in the area valve slam shut. It means just that. All kinds of things can really mess up arterial blood pressure measurements, especially small variables um, that congregate around risk continuities and things. There's all these little bubbles you know, in a monitoring system behave like capacitors in parallel. If you remember that from somewhere, your capacitors in parallel add a bunch of little micro bubbles. Yeah. So it looks like one big ass ball. You're trying to transduce it can it can all the way from the very thing you're trying to trying to measure. Okay. So there's a whole other concept with resonance where if, if the system is not set up properly, if we use the IV tubing instead of a much stiffer pressure tubing, we can actually end up creating uh, the, the resonant frequency of what we're trying to measure can actually go low. And we can artificially, because the monitor is going to look at this peak and this trough as a as a looking as pressure sheet. Very, very, very off. Bottom line after it's all going on with the heart. The Wigger's diagram shows very elegantly pressure and blood flow changes, and that's it. 